so a few things I didn't mention last time and last uh, in Monday's lecture are all these links at the top of the screen. So let's talk about these and, and what, they're, what they are and how I'm going to use them, utilize these throughout the semester. So I have a few external services that we're going to use to support the class. First, Twitch. The lectures will be streamed on Twitch. We're live right now. We're, we're uh, on the internet, I guess, whatever. Um, there are three sections of 116, one at 1 p.m., one at 3 p.m., one at 4, obviously this one at 4 p.m. All three of them, I'll stream all three, so if for whatever reason you want to watch more than one, you want to hear from me three times a day, I don't know. Uh, you have that option available to you. If you want to check out the lecture at 1 p.m. so you know what's coming up or, or whatever, um, all those options are available to you. Uh, uh, our wonderful TA Mike will take the, the broadcast from Twitch and upload the videos to YouTube so you can watch them on demand after that. You can watch them on Twitch too, but they delete the videos after whatever amount of time. I don't, I don't remember what it is, but uh, Mike's really good about doing that day of. Uh, so usually later the same day, you'll see those videos pop up on YouTube. All of last semester's videos are on YouTube. They're a little out of order. I changed the structure, just uh, moved around a few topics in the course. So they're a little out of order, but you do have all the videos from last semester as well. If you want to get ahead, you want to watch those, uh, those videos from last semester and get ahead on the content. You have that option available to you. I'm also streaming and posting on YouTube my 312 lectures at 10 a.m. I, I don't want to set up separate stuff for each course. I just don't feel like it. So, uh, so there will be that content. I don't know if you're interested, check it out. But don't get confused if you're watching a 312 lecture. I don't I'm not holding you accountable for that content, of course. Um, so don't get don't get confused if you see 312 stuff. Piazza and Discord are more of our our ways to communicate with each other. Piazza is the official. A more official app. If you have questions for myself, the course staff, questions about the course, questions about the homework, uh, post them on Piazza. Especially if you have a question related to your specific code. If that's the case, do not post it publicly. That's, of course, an academic integrity violation. But go on Piazza, make a post to the instructors. Post only to instructors so myself and all of the TAs can see it. And that will give us the maximum opportunity to be able to answer your question in a timely manner. We have uh, a lot of TAs who can get on there and answer that, uh, that question. We have wonderful TAs who will do that, or myself, I can get there, there as well. Probably the slowest way to get your answers, uh, questions answered is to email me and say, what's wrong with my code? I might get back to you, but it'll probably be like a month after the deadline. And by that, I'll just be like, I hope you were able to figure it out. Uh, it's just not the most effective way to get your questions answered. Either going to office hours live, or posting to instructors on Piazza. That's the best way to get your, your questions about your submission and your code answered. Uh, that's the best way. If you want something less formal, less official, we have Discord. Discord gets uh, uh, Discordy. I, I, don't, I don't really know the <laughs> best way to describe it. Uh, it will be less official, it will be less reverent. Uh, but if you just want to chat with other people who are in the course, chat with the TAs. The TAs are way more casual in Discord as well. They might also pick on you a little bit if you ask a silly question in, in Discord, where we're not going to do that in Piazza necessarily, unless it's a really off the wall question. Uh, but, uh, but Discord is a little, little less, uh, less sacred. So if you just want to chat, there, I've been using Discord for, for at least last semester. I think I've been using, is this the third semester yeah. using Discord? So, so uh, for the past two semesters I've been using it, I've been using the same server each time, so we do have a lot of alumni, uh, at least 116 alumni. Uh, there are some alumni alumni. Uh, but we have the past students in the course. Some of them still hang out in there. If you want to ask questions about 220, 250, if you want to ask them about later content in 116, et cetera, uh, there are tons of people in there willing to just chat with you, ask, answer your questions, and, and talk to you about the curriculum as a whole and things like that. Uh, so feel free to take advantage of that, or if you don't want to, that's fine. There are, are a lot of things here. If you only want to take advantage of one or two of them, just choose the ones that, that suit your needs the most. If you want that more official um, air about it, just hang out in Piazza. If you want that more just conversational attitude, add to Discord. If you want both, go to both. If you don't want either of them, you know, it's whatever you want to do. Next is GitHub. Most of the examples you'll see in lecture 
especially the ones that, the examples that appear on the slides, I'll have in this GitHub repo. There's tons of code in there, tons of stuff available to you. I recommend cloning that repo at some point. If clone the repo, that phrase doesn't mean anything to you. We'll get you caught up in, uh, in the labs and through the homeworks. I won't spend lecture content on that, but we will have ways to get you sped up on that. Uh, if all else fails, come to office hours and we'll help you with that. Uh, but clone, clone that repo, get that code on your laptop, and play around with the examples. I highly encourage you to play around with them, break those examples, change them around, make sure you understand how that code's working. Especially during a lecture, if you're playing with the code that's on the slide at the same time, I think that's a very effective way to really understand what's going on. Uh, and finally, Autolab. This is where we'll submit, uh, submit assignments. I just added everybody late last night. There were some students asking me why, uh, why they couldn't get into Autolab. I just uploaded the roster last night, so if those problems are still an issue, today, please let me know, because that means we've got some, uh, some problem. Especially if you just added the course after, I uploaded about midnight, so after midnight, if you upload, added the class this morning, uh, definitely let me know, I'll add you to, the, to Autolab. And I'll do another check after I drop, I'll, I'll resync the roster. Uh, but here, uh, this is where I'm going to post your results for all of your learning and application objectives. There's, there are no submissions for any of these, uh, these assignments, but this is where I'll post your results. So if you ever have a question of did I complete that objective or not, this is your definitive answer, this is the official answer. You go to that, uh, that assignment and you'll see either a zero or a one, did you complete it or not. And if it's a zero, uh, that's where I'll post my feedback to you. If you didn't complete this objective, this is why, this is what you can do to remedy that, et cetera. Uh, but this is where, so we're always on the same page. There's no surprise at the end of the semester, like, oh, I thought I had five, all five objectives, but surprise, you only had four, now you got enough. There's none of that. Autolab, that's your definitive answer. That's, uh, that's what I'm looking at. That's what you're looking at. We're on the same page. We know exactly where you are in terms of objectives met. We also have the first lecture question today. To submit a lecture question, you click check this box saying you didn't cheat. Submit, that's gonna pull up your file dialog. Choose the zip file for that assignment, then upload it and Autolab will, will check it for you and give you your results. Uh, towards the end of today's lecture, after the slides, I'll go through creating a project, writing some code, creating a zip file from that project, and then uploading to Autolab. So we'll get the, the other side of this by the end of the lecture. On the course, schedule on the course website. Uh, of course, we have these links to, to install IntelliJ and stuff, but this little symbol here will be for the slides for each lecture. So if you want a PDF version of the slides, PDF so it opens in your browser and, and without having to fire up PowerPoint or something silly, uh, will be the slides for each day. I won't always have the slides up super early, uh, but whenever I do, the lecture question will be the second slide. It'll be right after the title slide. So if you want to see what the lecture question is for that day and the slides are posted early, uh, feel free to check those out. I will always have the slides posted at least by 1 p.m. on the day of lecture because that's when the first lecture is. That's my hard deadline. I have to have slides by then or else I don't know what I'm doing for lecture. Uh, but I'll try to be ahead of it. Of course, I say that every semester. And then the semester happens and I'm completely wiped out. Um, but I will try to get the slides. For example, Friday slides are up already, but I don't, uh, I'm not at Mondays yet. So if you want to check out Friday's lecture question, lecture question, it's in the slides, it's on Autolab. If you want to read ahead, study ahead, you can complete Friday's lecture question as well, right now. <clears throat> Are there any questions about the structure of the course or any course related questions before we get into some content? Yep. Yes, uh, so I don't have office hours yet. There's, right after this lecture, I actually have a TA meeting. I'm gonna try to get all our office hours synced up and post it on the website. I'll get those. My office hours are going to be Tuesdays one to three. Uh, so I do know that off the top of my head, but I don't memorize all the TAs who, who have submitted. But I'll get that schedule up. Um, we'll probably start office hours tomorrow. We'll probably make it Piazza Post. I gotta talk to them all during the meeting, see how prepared we are. Um, we are for that. They should start. No, realistically, they should start tomorrow because I have a lecture question now. Yeah, well, you can count on them starting tomorrow. Today's hold me to that if I forget during the meeting. Make sure, uh, make sure I say that. Uh, all right. Any other questions? 
Let's get into it. So the lecture question today, as I said, each, uh, each presentation is going to start with the lecture question. I, I want to start with what should you be able to do by the end of this lecture, and this is what we should be able to do by the end of this lecture. So uh, this is a lot of 115 content, but in Scala, we want to learn Scala over the next two lectures. The next two lectures will really have the feel of, you already know how to do this <coughs> stuff, Bless you. But here's the specific syntax of how to do it in Scala. That's what, what today and Friday are going to sound like. So this is kind of a module one question type question. If you took 115 here, uh, given the weight of a package that needs to be shipped, give me the shipping cost as a piecewise function. If it's under 30 pounds, then always I've been pointing at the wrong one in the other two lectures. If it's under 30 pounds, we're going to have a flat cost of $5. If it's over 30 pounds, it's $5 plus a quarter for each pound over 30. And you can have fractions of a pound. This takes doubles and returns doubles. So if you have 30.5 pounds, the cost to ship should be $5.12.5. And, and, uh, and I just got this question after the, the previous lecture, so let me, let me throw this one out there. Uh, don't truncate, I know we're dealing with currency, but don't truncate your numbers. I'm going to treat those as doubles. So if there's a, a long, uh, even a repeating decimal or something, just keep the entire value. You don't have to truncate to the penny. You don't have to round to the nearest penny or anything. Even though it's currency, we're going to kind of gloss over that detail. Okay. Start where every programming course should start, I guess. Hello world. The, the default starting point. So once you have IntelliJ installed, set up, you have the, uh, the JDK installed, you have the Scala SDK installed, you have the Scala plugin in installed and everything. Everything's all set up. You've gone through the tutorials on the, the course website. Uh, and I made a Piazza post today. There's some, uh, some versions that have to, be, uh, have to be specific versions of things. Once you have all that set up, you go into IntelliJ, File, New, Project. You're going to get this dialog box, pick Scala, an idea, and it's going to set up the structure of your project for you. The main thing that'll do is create a folder named SRC where all of your code is going to go. So once we have that st project started, we can create our first Scala program that we're going to talk about. It's a little bright. Let's go all the way down. Is that fine? So, as the name implies, this is just going to say, hello, Scala. Just print that to the screen. But let's pick this apart and see what's going on. There's a lot of new stuff here that you haven't necessarily seen unless you've done some Java. It'll look familiar to you if you've seen Java. Uh, but if you're coming from Python, Python would just be print hello Python. Uh, JavaScript is just console.log hello JavaScript. So we have quite a bit more structure here just to get off the ground with the program. So let's talk about that extra structure. Starting with the first line, this package declaration. This is saying where this code lives. What package does this live in? Which means where does this live in your project structure? Where is this code? Uh, and this package structure very strongly should, that, that I argue that that should be a must, must match the directory structure, but very strongly should match the directory structure in your SRC, your source directory. So. To keep your code organized, your packages should match your directory structure. So this code, this file, is in a directory <coughs> named src, the, the directory that was created for me by IntelliJ when I created my project. And then inside week one, the start of the package, and inside the subdirectory basics, the rest of that package. So I'm going to create a, a class, uh, a, an object, a file, inside that directory, and then say that lives inside that package. It's going to match that directory structure. Helps us keep our projects organized, especially when we have lots and lots of files. We'll organize them in this directory structure, and then have a package structure that will match exactly that file structure. So the directory structure matches what our code says, where our code says that uh, code will be, that stuff will be. Create new packages by right-clicking a directory, new package. It'll create a package in that directory, in the SRC directory, or a sub-package if that directory already is a package. Next, we have this object hello. So we're creating what's called a Scala object and naming it hello. 
An object is kind of our top level structure of a program. This object block is going to contain variables and somewhat functions, what we want to think of as functions. But when functions are part of an object and they're defined with the keyword def, we got to call them something different. Uh, we call them methods at that point. So a, an object is going to be a collection of variables and methods packaged all in one object structure. And we have to have objects, or later we'll see classes. Or actually, I take that back. We have to have objects if we want to define a program in Scala. Next, we have our main method. When we run an object as a program, Scala is going to look for a main method. That's a method with this exact header. It has to be a, uh, a method named main that takes an array of strings and returns unit. We'll talk all about what that means in terms of method definition. We'll create our own methods later today. But you need a main method with this header, which you shouldn't have, you shouldn't memorize, you don't have to memorize that, but just know uh, you have to have that in, uh, in your code. Once you have a method with that exact header, finally we can start writing some code that's going to be executed. So when I run the object hello from the package week1.basics, Scala's going to look for that main method and then run that block of code defined by that main method, which, of course, here just prints hello Scala. So our program here isn't doing anything interesting, but that's how the structure that we need just to get a program off the ground in Scala. If you're coming from Java, if you've taken uh, some Java in high school or, or wherever else, this will look pretty familiar to you. Scala and Java are very similar languages. They both compile to Java bytecode. They both run on the JVM. So once Java or Scala code is compiled, that code will look the same to the JVM. It'll run Scala code just like Java code. So there are many, many similarities between those languages. So if you're coming from Java, a lot of this will look familiar. If you want to learn Java after this class, a lot of that's going to look very familiar. If you want to pick up Java after this class, it should be pretty easy for you because you'll, you'll be familiar with Scala. Okay. Let's so learn about methods and variables, and then later we'll look at conditionals uh, in our next example. But methods and variables. Let's take a look at a, a more interesting example, more interesting than Hello World at least, and uh, talk about how this works. So even if you have no exposure to Scala, you could probably look through this code and reason about what this does. If I didn't show you this right here, you could probably read through this code and say, yeah, it's probably going to print 14 to the screen. But it's a whole different story when you go to write a Scala program. That's where it gets a lot more difficult. So how, what's every piece that's needed here? And how would we recreate something like this? When you have to write your own program, what's needed? What does all this stuff mean? What's going on here? That's what we want to talk about in this example. So first, let's talk about this method definition. So we're defining a method that we're going to call later. This is very similar to, to defining and calling functions that you've seen in 115. We're calling it a method because it's part of an object. But you can, for the most part, until later in the semester, you can think of functions and methods as being synonymous, uh, as being uh, the same thing. The one difference, the technical difference, is a method has access to any variables that are defined in the object. We're not going to have variables defined in the objects quite yet. We're not going to mess with that until we get to OOP. Uh, actually, I take that back. We'll get to it next Friday, I believe. Um, so we're not going to mess with that yet, but that's the difference between a method and a function, the quick overview. So here, we're defining a method. And the big thing to know here is that we have to define our types of the method. So we start with the keyword def the, to say, hey, Scala, I'm about to define a method. This is just like the keyword def in Python. It's just like the keyword function in JavaScript. We're just giving a heads up, hey, there's a, there's a method declaration coming up. It's going to be the next code that I type. The name of the method, no changes here. This is just like any other language. Then the parameter list is the first big difference that we see. So we have to name our parameters. Here I have one parameter named input. But I have to declare the type of every parameter. So here I'm saying there's one parameter. I'm going to call it input, and then a colon, and then a type. 
a Scala type, which is going to be the type of that variable. What I'm saying through this is that this method takes a double as an input, and Scala will hold me to that. It will force me to only call this method with either doubles or, I have to put an asterisk on this one, something that Scala can automatically convert to a double. For example, if I call this method with an int, Scala will be like, ah, I got you, I'm going to convert that into a double for you. But I have to give this, this method has to end up getting a double, whether we give it a double or Scala auto converts and, and ends up giving it a double. This method can only take a double as its input. Anything else, Scala will just refuse to run our program. We cannot run our program. We'll have what's called a compiler error, and it will not run. It will not compile, and it will not run. So we have to define our types of our inputs. Similarly, we have to define the type of our output. So after the parameter list, we have another colon and then another type. This is going to be the return type of our method. So this method has to take a double and it has to return a double. If both of those are not true, we're going to get errors. Things are going to crash and burn. We're not going to be able to run our code. These are very serious in Scala. Scala is what's called a strongly typed language takes types very seriously. It will always ask for our types. We have to have our types clearly defined. And Scala holds us to those types. If we ever say that's going to be a double and we use it without a double, it's going to yell at us. It's not going to run. It's not going to work for us. So our types is the first big difference that we're going to see in Scala. We are in a strongly typed language as opposed to Python and JavaScript. They treat types very loosely. Um, Scala, not quite, not the same. We have to have our types always clearly defined. The next thing that's, you have a question? Uh, just a question, like why do the methods not have any return statements? Yeah, it's a good question. We're gonna talk about that right here. Uh, so there, there are, so this method, the next thing you'll notice, which you definitely just noticed, there's no return statement, there's no return keyword. So how does this method know what to return? This, uh, this gets, this can get a little, uh, look a little weird at first because there's no return, how am I returning anything? So the return value of a method is going to be the last expression that's executed during the call of that method. So here I only have one expression, input times two, that's going to resolve to a double. So that's the last expression that was executed during the call of that method. So that's going to be the return value and luckily it is of type double. I'm multiplying two doubles, that's going to result in a double. So I'm matching my return type, and that's going to be what's returned here. There is a return keyword in Scala, and it does what you would expect it to do from other languages. Its use is very discouraged by the Scala community. We don't, uh, uh, we don't want to be using return statements. It's, uh, uh, more, more of a, like a community, more of a best practices thing. You, you can use it, the language will allow it, but it's very discouraged by the community and by best practices. You really shouldn't be using return statements in Scala. Scala doesn't force you to, and there are issues that can result from using return statements. We've heard debates about GoTo. It's kind of similar, it's not as strong as GoTo, but it's kind of similar to that. If you have a return statement in the middle of your method, there's certain things that you can no longer reason about that method because during some certain execution, it might short circuit and just return in the middle of it, depending on your conditionals and everything. So Scala says, hey, Scala community says, maybe uh, let's just not use return statements. You won't see any return statements in my code throughout the semester. If you use them in your code, I mean, I'm not gonna yell at you or anything, but, um, but they are discouraged in Scala. If you're gonna be a Scala developer, uh, return statements are very discouraged. So, but this line, I'll repeat this probably 10 more times uh, today as we go through this. But the last expression to be evaluated during the call of a method is the return value of that method, and it must match the return type. It must have that type. Now, declaring variables. Here I'm using the keyword var for variable. That means I'm declaring a variable. I'm going to give it a name, and with the same syntax as my parameter <coughs> list, I'm going to give it a uh, I'm going to say colon and then a type to give this variable a type. Now I have a variable named x of type double. This variable x 
can only store doubles now. I cannot assign any other value to x. Its type cannot change. It's always only going to be able to store doubles. And I'm going to assign it the double literal 7.0. So x is going to store that 7.0, and uh, uh, which is a double, so I'm satisfying that. But I can never store it something else in x. It has to store it. doubles. Our variables are type. Our inputs are type. Our return values are type. Everything has to have a clearly defined type. To call our methods, the syntax is exactly what you would expect from any language. I'm going to call this with x. x is a double, so I satisfy the type here, and this is going to return a double. And I have something that's very, uh, that seems contradictory to what I just said. Like, all our types have to be clearly defined. Well, I just declared a variable result, and I didn't give it a type. I didn't say colon double here. I didn't give this a type. This is something Scala does for us. I, I won't use it too much. I want to use it right here just to, just to show that this exists. Uh, but I, I try to define, in all my examples, define all the types. It's good practice to define your types. But if Scala can determine what the type should be, if it's deterministic, if there's only one type that it could be, Scala's going to say, oh, I got you. I'm, I'm just going to make it that type. So the variable result has to have a type. Every variable has to have a type. And the type of result, since Scala is going to look at multiply by 2, see that that returns a double, and it has to return a double, and Scala is going to be very strict about making sure it always returns a double. Since this returns a double, and then I'm assigning that to the variable result, Scala is going to say, now I got you. You're assigning a double to this variable. That variable has to be of type double. There's no other choice. There's no other option. So I'm not going to make you type out colon double. We're on the same page here. It can only be one thing. Let's just agree that it's going to be that thing. So the variable result is of type double, and it can only store doubles. If I try to say uh, on the next line, result equals 2. Actually, that example works because 2 is going to be auto-converted to, to a double. But if I say result equals uh, the string high, I'm going to get an error. I'm going to get reassignment to, of a string to a double. It's not allowed. It's not going to let me do that. It's going to be an error. So result is of type double, but I don't have to explicitly state it if, well, uh, it's called inference. If Scala can infer the type, then it's going to make it that type. Uh, but again, it's always best practice to say colon double here. Uh, in later examples, I'll have my types clearly defined. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, I uh, don't have them in later examples, later in the course, way after this. But when we're talking about types, I like having my types there. Any, any other, any questions on this example before we go on to the next one? Yeah? How can I void functions? Ooh, sorry, what was that? Void, void functions? functions? Void methods? Like, void. do you have any return type? Yep. Uh, so like our main, main method doesn't return anything. We use the yeah. keyword unit, the type unit for that. So like void in JavaScript means this doesn't return anything. In Scala, it's unit with a capital U. So unit means this method doesn't return anything. And we'll talk, on Friday, we'll talk more in depth about all the, uh, not all, obviously, but uh, some of the most common different types. And we'll talk about each one of them, what each one of them uh, means. Unit pretty much means nothing. This doesn't return anything. So we say uh, we, it has to have a return type. So we say its return type is unit, uh, which is similar to void, return type void in Java. Any other questions on this example? Yes. In main, so the the last uh, the last statement is this print line in main, but e even if there is even if this was a double in the last line of main, since its return type is unit, that's treated a little special. It would just say even though the last expression was a double, this doesn't return anything, so let's not return it if the return type is unit. Uh, but for example, if print line of input was the last line of multiplied by two, now we have an error because we didn't return a double. We didn't satisfy that contract. Yeah, question. Um, 
how is object different from Java plus five? Uh, we'll, we'll start talking about that in depth on Friday. The short answer is an object is one instance of a class. So I can't use this to create more, uh, more objects of this type. Whereas a class is like a blueprint to create a lot of objects. If I say object and define an object, I only have one of those. It's kind of like a singleton if you're familiar with that. There can only be one object of type first object. Just like an abstract class. Uh, not, not quite. So an abstract class, you can still extend it multiple times and create many instances of it. Uh, it'd be like a static class in Java, would be the, the core there. Could you make an explicit then? We can talk more about it later if you want. Uh, but we will get into that content in depth. <coughs> All right. Any other questions on this example? Let's talk about conditionals. So this is our third and last example we'll see today. Let's start. Uh, let's learn conditionals and let's combine it with a few other things and uh, a few more things here. Just more syntax. Uh, and a few implications, one big implication of methods. The fact that a method, the return value is the last state, uh, last expression that's executed. So here, again, you should be able to read through this code, just kind of guessing what, what things mean. We have two thresholds, 60 and 30, and we want to tell if an input, uh, you can think of these as the packages from the lecture question, an input size of a package, very uh, loosely does it fit into one of these categories, large, medium, or small. So a package of weight 70, that's above my large threshold, so I'm going to return large. 50 is in between them, so I'll return medium. 10 is below the medium threshold, so I'll return small. So how does this happen? What's the new syntax here? And what are we looking at? The first thing that's a little different, I'm declaring two variables, but instead of using var, I'm using val. The difference here, a value of a Val will define a value, which means its value cannot change, as opposed to var, which defines a variable, where its value can vary uh, from the name. It can change, the value can change in a variable. This is similar to val being const in JavaScript and var being let in JavaScript, if, you've, if you took uh, 115 last semester. Uh, you should be familiar with those. So it's similar to that, val cannot change. The, the value large will always store 60 for its entire lifetime until it falls out of scope and is destroyed. It will always store 60, medium will always store 30. Cannot change. If I try to change the value, if I say large, on the next line, large equals 59, I get an error, my code won't compile. Yes, question? Can you pass it to different can you cast it to a different type? I yes, yes you can. So if I wanted to convert large to an int, I would be able to do that because the value stored in large is not changing, but I can say large, take your value, change it to an int, and then reassign that to a separate variable. But I couldn't say large equals large dot to int. I wouldn't be able to do that. I can't reassign to large, but I can use that value and do things with it and, and change its value based on that. All right, our conditional, I really don't have much to say about this one. The syntax is pretty much identical to JavaScript. I have the keyword if, I have a conditional, I have a block of code that's executed if it's true, else if, conditional, block of code, else, block of code. It's all the same as JavaScript, uh, same functionality as Python, except the syntax is different in Python with, uh, uh, with white space being a thing, an important thing in Python. Um, and elif, because it's too much to type se space in Python. Um, but the syntax is really identical to JavaScript. Uh, or if you're coming from Java, the syntax is identical to Java. So I don't have much to talk about with the if statement itself. You have a question? What's your print statement um, after the if statement? What's the first thing? So, so that's going to be part of the return value, and that's the big thing I do want to talk about with this conditional. So the print statements are in the main method. So once I get the return value from compute size, I'm going to print it. But the big burning question is how do we get those return values? And that's what I want to spend the next slide talking about here. So how am I returning the right value on this? 
So, and this is where we're combining a few things that we saw. Primarily, the last expression that's evaluated in a method call is its return value. That's simple when the last line is just an expression by itself, or the other method that we saw, which was just one expression, uh, that's easy to look at. But now, the last thing that we do in our method call is a conditional. So that conditional is going to determine what the last expression to be evaluated is. So for example, when we call this with compute size of 70, 70 is greater than or equal to large, which is 60. So this string literal is executed. This is a valid expression, it's just a string literal, but this is a valid expression, it resolves to its literal value, large. Then we skip to the end of the if of the conditional and then the end of the method. There's nothing else to be executed. So if this condition is true, large is the last expression executed, there's nothing else to execute, so large is the last expression to be executed, which means large is the return value of this method because that was the last thing that it executed. When, uh, when we have an input of 50, false, true, executed, execute this block, which just contains the string literal medium, which is an expression, it's a valid expression. Code jumps here, nothing left to run. So medium is the return value because it was the last expression to be evaluated during that method call. And then the same thing for small. If both of these are false, this is the last expression to be evaluated. So we can kind of leverage conditionals. If we have a conditional as the last statement in our method, we can use the conditional to determine what's going to be returned without using separate uh, return statements, without saying if this return large, else if return medium, else return small. We're just leaving out those returns and depending on the if statement to tell us what the last expression to be evaluated is. And when we go to the, the live code, I'll, I'll give a few more examples of that and how this can break in quite a few ways. Uh, but before that, are there any questions on this example? So once we have IntelliJ set up, go through the links on the course website. I made a Piazza post with versions. I think I mentioned that in this lecture. They're all going to be blending together all semester. Um, but once that's all set up, just like we saw earlier in the slide deck, we're going to go, go to File, New, Project, Scala, Idea. And that's going to set up a project with the structure that we expect in class. So I'm going to give my project a name. And what that does is create a project for me with a directory of the name of the project, uh, whatever name I gave the project, a directory named .idea. This is for ID settings, for IntelliJ settings. Uh, it's something we never really have to mess with. You really don't need to be in that folder unless you're doing some, some really uh, uh, different stuff. Uh, but most importantly, this SRC folder. This is where all of your source code is going to go. Any code you write is going to go in the SRC folder. We're not going to put it in the SRC folder directly, though. We're going to right-click, go to New, Package. And I'll just create a package named Lecture, similar to the lecture question. And that's going to create a directory for me for that package. So IntelliJ is going to enforce the package structure should match your directory structure. Uh, so we, we don't really have to think about that too much. So we're going to create a package. You could kind of think of it as creating a directory. It's going to create that for us. I can right click lecture, new Scala class. I'm going to have a drop down. That zooming isn't doing much for me, is it? Uh, we're going to have a drop down. I could create a class. We're not quite there yet, so we'll create an object and name that object something. Uh, if you don't select object, I'll select class, just in case uh, somebody does that, which would be a very reasonable thing to do. It'll just put class here, and you can always change this to object. And now it's an object. 
And you can see it sets up the structure for me. It creates uh, that first object. It puts it in the package lecture. It sets up a lot of the structure for me. IntelliJ is going to do a lot of stuff for us. It has some nice features. My favorite features is autosave. This, uh, this file is already saved on the hard drive. Every time I type, it's going to automatically save that. So I don't have to worry about control S uh, constantly, command S all the time. Next feature, I showed you that main method. I said the main method has to have this header, but you should never memorize that or, or, uh, or devote any brain power to uh, memorizing that sequence of characters for the main method. Well, how are we going to get away with that? In IntelliJ, I'm just going to type main, enter, and it's going to do it for me. You shouldn't ever have to memorize that string, uh, that sequence of characters to get the main header. Later on in the class, you'll start to understand what everything there really means, and we can start using that. Um, the array of strings here, those are the command line arguments if you're calling this uh, program through the command line. It's not something we're going to do in 116. I believe you'll do it in 220. Is that accurate? Not really, I guess. Uh, so you might do it for later on in your career. You almost certainly do it. Uh, for 116, we're not going to mess with that. So uh, you'll understand what the header means, but uh, that array of strings we just won't really mess with. We don't really have a reason to um, in this in this course. If there were a reason, we'd do it, but. I'll see a reason. Anyway, so let's create a method. I'm just going to create a method with a, a very interesting name. You have a question? Uh, what's the difference between object and class? So a, this is something we'll talk about in depth later in the semester, starting next Friday, I believe. Uh, but an object is a like a collection of variables and methods. We haven't put any variables in there yet just methods. A class is used to create multiple objects. So if you want a lot of objects of the same type, you would create a class and that class is going to be like a template that's used to create those objects. For example, um, uh, for example, int is a class that we use to create many different ints. Uh, we don't have just one object of type int because then we could only have one int in our programs. Ever. We'd only be able to have one int. So we can only have one first object object in our programs anywhere in our code. But we only need one because it's just storing, it's just one program that we want to run. Um, but something like int, we want lots of those, so we would create that. Or string, we create that as a class so we can create many instances of that class. Uh, so I'm going to write a method that takes an int, returns an int. I'm going to have my structure there. We're going to see our first error, our first Scala error. Yes. Uh, so I have an error right here. The, the mistake I made, I shouldn't say mistake because I know, uh, I know what, what's happening. Let me set up just a little more structure here. Prompt. Uh, so I have an error here. So I created this method. I said it takes an int. I'm going to call it with an int. We're all fine there. But I said this returns an int. The return type is int. And Scala's saying, whoa, 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 hold on. You said this is going to return an int. But I cannot guarantee that the last expression evaluated in this method call is an int. In fact, there are no expressions at all. So I'm going to get this error that says return type is unit. You're returning a unit, but you said the return type is int. It's a type mismatch. Can't allow that. Uh, I'm returning nothing, but I said I was going to return it. So we can fix that by making sure the last expression is an int. Just returning zero will get rid of my error enough so I can talk about running programs, but then we'll add something to this method in a little bit. So if I'm just returning zero, I expect zero to be printed here. Zero is returned. Uh, how we run a program, there's a few options. Once we have all the structure, we have an object with a main method and something that's going to run. We can click these green arrows on the sidebar, or we can do what I'm going to do here, right-click the file name and click Run. And that's going to run this code. It's going to take a few seconds because it's going to do something called compiling. Uh, we'll talk about um, in a few lectures. It's going to compile our code and then run it. 
and print zero to the screen as we expect. Once we run a program, we have this go button on the top. This is going to run the last program that we've ran, which is very convenient, especially if you're editing one file but you want to run a different one, you just hit the go button on the top. You won't always have direct access to these buttons to run it. All right, so now that we have a, we wrote a program, we're able to run it, let's do something a little more interesting here. So I just want some conditional if, I don't know, if the number is greater than 10, number minus 5, else if number less than or equal to 10, number plus 2. I don't know. So I have my code. If this number is greater than 10, I want to do one thing. If it's less than or equal to 10, I want to do another thing. Problem is I got a lot of red squiggles. It's never good. Red squiggles are never good. It means my program will not run. I'm just going to get a bunch of errors. So what did I, what did I do wrong here? Exactly. So, so I said that this method returns an int, which means the last expression evaluated has to be an int. I told you I'd say that about 10 times. I think I'm almost there. It has to be an int. So I know and you know that if I give this any number, there's no number I can give it that's not going to hit either the if or the else if. It's either greater than 10 or it's less than or equal to 10. But that's not good enough for Scala. Scala will not accept that and should not accept that. It says, no, you have to have absolute guaranteed proof that you will always evaluate to an int. So if both of these happen to be false, we're not going to run any expression that returns an int, much less the last expression being an int. So Scala's yelling at me and saying, hey, I'm not going to allow that. So we can get rid of this error by adding an else if I can just return minus one if there's an error. And I do believe that the error, there are inputs that we could give this that wouldn't hit the if or the else if. If, uh, if we give this a value that's not actually an int, we can, use, we can give it uh, something to the effect of null. I was trying to break this in the last lecture. It wasn't successful. But there's something we could give this, I believe. Let me try, let me try one more thing. I think I can break this. Oops, whoa, that's not what I wanted. All right, all right, um, I'm not gonna go down this road too much, but I really want, I really want to be able to break it. No, I'm not gonna get there. Well, there's, there's a challenge if anybody wants to take it, how to break it. Um, I tried just passing null. That didn't work last time. Yes? Yes. Uh, I personally don't like it. I personally don't like it, but that is allowed. Is that what you were asking? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not a fan personally, but if that's your style, go for it. Uh, it is valid, Scala. I like always having the braces, making sure everything's explicit. Uh, but that's just me. If that's your style, go for it. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't really write this like this. I'd recommend. Change this to this. If it's not greater than 10, just run your else as an else. Don't have an else if as another conditional. Uh, I go through this one because that's an error I see on the lecture question quite a bit. Uh, and one more warning, if I do have negative one here, I'm always going to return negative one. If you have anything after the conditional, the conditional no longer matters if you're using the conditional to decide your return value. Now, I'm always returning negative one regardless of the conditional. Uh, so that's, that's a big, uh, big oopsie. Uh, the last thing I want to show, once I have this program, I'm really happy with it. I think it's the best program. 
uh, that I've ever created. I'm going to go to File, Export to Zip File. And I'm going to get this dialog box to save. Make sure you remember where you're saving this file. I've seen some very frustrated students who would keep saving, uh, editing their code, saving in one place, and then they go to upload to Autolab and they're uploading a different zip file and they're pulling their hair out saying, why do the results never change no matter what I do? Uh, it's because they're uploading the wrong zip file. So be cognizant of where you're saving this and what you're saving it as. Go to Autolab, submit, choose that zip file you just created. Personally, I like to look at the date modified to make sure that's the one I just created. Submit. And I don't expect to get any points for the lecture question because I did something completely different than the lecture question. Uh, but once we get to this next screen where everybody matches refresh until they get the results, you're going to get one of two results. You'll get lecture question does not pass all tests or lecture question complete. It's the only feedback you're going to get is, did it pass all, all my testing or not? Uh, it's not going to give you other feedback. This is a big step towards weaning you off of feedback. We give a decent amount of feedback in 115. I'm giving nothing but your overall grade, at least for the lecture questions in 116. Uh, one, one last warning, because I saw this a few students asking questions after lecture, after the previous lecture. Make sure your package name starts with a lowercase l. I see, for some, whatever reason, I see a lot of uppercase l's in this package name. And when the only feedback you're getting is didn't pass all tests, it's going to drive you nuts uh, with that uppercase l. With that, I'll see everyone Friday.